Hi guys, this is Charles. I'm one of the surgeons at Mouthpaws. And we are doing an antibrachial soft tissue sarcoma in a Rhodesian Ridgeback today. Um, this is the medial aspect of the right forelimb. And we've got this mass here that's somewhat mo mobile, although it feels like it's, un uh, it's attached to the underlying antibrachial fascia. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel. Make sure you turn on notifications so you'll get a ding, ding on your phone when we live stream again later on. Um, anyway, so this is the mass here. Now, there's a lot of discussion about um, the size of margins that you need to get with different types of tumors. And we used to say universally, kind of arbitrarily, you want to get two to three, to centimeter, two to three centimeter margins in all directions. But um, in human medicine, basically, all they try to do is get one cell layer beyond the last cancer cell. And so that can be hard to predict, but at least with a tumor like this, we know that it's gonna be well circumscribed and it's, gonna, it's less likely to have tentacles extending in all directions. So um, in this case, I feel very comfortable getting just about a centimeter margin in all directions. And there was a study that was done in antibrachial soft tissue sarcomas previously that showed that even if you do just a marginal excision, meaning that you cut all the way up to the tumor um, your recurrence rate in that study was reported to be about 10% in three years. So um, based on that, I am more confident being less aggressive, um, particularly with anabrachial tumors. Now, this is a very different story from when, you know, if I had um, a grade three soft tissue sarcoma in a dog or an injection site sarcoma in a cat, where much wider margins are required in order to get local control. Um, with those cases, if you are less aggressive, you will, you know, almost certainly get a recurrence. So then the other issue that comes up with these types of tumors is what um, kind of closure we're going to do. And the answer is we're probably not going to do any closure at all. So we're probably just going to leave it open to heal by second inch. And uh, one of my former residents, who's now a surgeon in Colorado, Cassie Pripage, and I did a study where we had 31 cases where we did wide local excision on antibrachial soft tissue sarcomas, and we left them all to heal by second intention. We got 100% clean margins, 100% local recurrence, I mean, local um, control, and all of them, except for two, went ahead and healed um, on their own completely just with second intention. So um, you don't necessarily need to do fancy flaps and grafts and that kind of thing. So um, I've got a little bleeder right here. Get my ligature out. Um, now, the other thing that's um, interesting with these types of tumors is that you guys can see this really thick white layer here. That's the antibrachial fascia, and that provides a really good barrier to tumor penetration. And so um, that's going to provide our deep margin for this resection. We are gonna sacrifice probably the, uh, well, there's a large vein going into the tumor. I'm not sure if we're gonna sacrifice the cephalic vein or not. Um, I don't think we're quite far enough around to have to get to that. But there is a large vessel going, can you retract on that for me, please? There's a large vessel going into the tumor right about here that we are gonna ligature. I like using cauter here because you can see that I'm making a mark in my antibrachial fascia. So I'll know that even if this separates away from the tumor, that I'll know exactly the margin that I need to get. Yes, please. All right, so that's pretty much loose. Now I'm just gonna grab my Metzen bombs 
and I'm going to cut through that antibrachial fascia. So that's that the fascia right here. Look at that nice thick fascia, and that's going to provide my my barrier to deep tumor penetration. making mention that we uh, were suctioning the quarry pins. Yeah, that's that's Jeff's idea. <laughs> um, so now you can see here that we've got this really nice um, antibrachial fascia deep to the tumor. So that's going to provide um, uh, that's going to provide our um, um, our deep barrier. So that's pretty much it for the surgery. I'll see if there's anything that I can close e easily. But we can certainly just leave this to heal by second intention without any problem whatsoever. We do this all the time. It's going to take kind of in the neighborhood of six to eight weeks to heal. The owners are aware of this. We do charge for the bandage changes. question if you did have to sacrifice the cephalic vein would you get any um edema distally um not at all there's so much collateral ligament so the question is would we get edema distally if we sacrifice the cephalic vein and the answer to that is no not not a bit of um of edema that uh would not cause any problem whatsoever so i'm just going to release this so i can pull this around a little bit more and see if I can do anything to approach closure. Not much. Might be able to shrink it down a little bit. Can I get some um, two OPDS, please? Grab the needle driver. And so um, as far as close, uh, closure and dressing is concerned, I'll just use some kind of non-inherent, either a telfa or melalin or something like that. I'm not a gooper, so I would not put any Vaseline or, or honey or anything on it. There was a study that was done by Bryden Stanley recently that showed that honey in a wound like this actually delays wound healing. Um, that was with Manuka honey. And those were sterile wounds. It might make more of a difference or it might help in infected wounds. Another question about how often the bandage changes would be performed initially and then so once granulation formed? Bandage changes would be done every three days until we get granulation tissue forming and then about every six days. I'm just grabbing onto the muscle here. I'll pull that across and see how I'm suturing the skin directly to the muscle and that's just going to adhere it down. Just give it a little bit of head start as far as um, formation of granulation tissue and then re-epithelialization and contraction. So that's how these guys heal is they initially form granulation tissue and then they start re-epithelializing and, um, and contracting. And they'll keep contracting until the tension inside the wound exceeds the tension outside of the wound. Um, and then they'll stop contracting. Sorry, once the tension outside the wound exceeds the tension inside the wound. And it's really interesting, the fibroblasts that form within the wound actually differentiate and become myofibroblasts where they uh, develop actin and myosin filaments and actually actively contract the wound closed, which I always thought was fascinating. Someone's asking how we're doing with the fires that are all going on at the moment. If we're seeing more animals from that, uh, we don't see a lot of fi uh, a lot of animals from uh, bushfires. I um, mean, I'm not sure why that is. One thing is that we don't have an emergency center here. 
I have treated some animals with skin grafts and stuff in the past, but nothing this year. And Melbourne hasn't been hit too hard, I don't think, so no. far. It's more up in Sydney and, uh, and kind of Brisbane, Queensland, so southern Queensland area. Thanks for asking. Now, some people will try to do a skin graft right at the time of surgery using a vac system, like a Pico drain or something like that. And I've tried that a few times, and we've had some other vets try that here a few times with no success. Um, the, the skin grafts that are performed without granulation tissue overlying, in my experience, universally fail. Um, I don't know what we did wrong or what we've been doing wrong. Uh, skin grafts on a healthy granulation tissue bed on the other hand, survive in about 85% of cases. And so if the owner gets tired of bandage changes and we've got healthy granulation tissue, I'm happy to go to a skin graft, a full thickness skin graft at that time. And uh, in our study of 31 cases, we had some that were probably 90, 90 plus percent circumferential. So just connected by a little um, isthmus of, of skin and they still healed completely for the uh, majority of them. And this dog will not be on antibiotics post-operatively. I'm sure somebody was going to ask that. <laughs> uh, you can go ahead and ask about charting now. <clears throat> so that is it. So we're just going to talk about charting. Um, uh, we do get rid of the sutures at about two weeks once we have sufficient granulation tissue. Um, alginate as a primary dressing, I've never used it. Um, I think that dogs form plenty of granulation tissue without um, using alginate up yet. So I think that the best healing that you'll get, in my opinion and in my experience, is just a nice dry non-adherent bandage. Um, so we'll start uh, talking about Post-op charting, so, so methadone, pain relief, um, and I don't think we need a narcotic or a fentanyl patch, but I would um, send it home with codeine. And staying overnight. Staying overnight. And anti-inflammatory, so meloxicam. Subcut Yep. We weren't hypertensive. No. Okay. Um, loading dose or maintenance? Uh, just maintenance is fine. No ABs. Yeah, yeah. No ABs. No other meds. No other meds. Uh, sedation. Uh, yep. Whatever ACE or Domitor. Yes. And yes. Uh, so first bandage change in three days. So that would be on Thursday, and then on Monday after that probably. 
No. Oh, sweet. All right. So that's it. Um, and so a uh, question about second intention healing, even if skin plasties are readily available. Look, if I can find tissue locally to close this, I would. Um, like it's possible we could even have done a little flap up here or something to have pulled it. But I've done so many of them just by second intention in this location that, that I usually, my first approach is to keep it simple. Um, uh, you know, on the trunk or, or um, you know, lateral chest wall, abdominal wall, if I've got a local flap that I can do, I'll, um, I'll close it. Uh, so just looking at the other questions. So yeah, we do get rid of the sutures after there's granulation tissue. Uh, and I've already answered how often we would change them. Um, and so what was that? What, what does a granulation tissue like this look after? So after, um, after this is healed, often we'll see a hairless area right in the middle, in the area that healed by reepithelialization, and then the rest will have regular haired skin. So you'll often see a scar that lasts forever, um, but it's not a problem with the owners. This one's, you know, medial aspect of the anabrachium, so it won't cause any issue. Um, <clears throat> so that is, I think, it. Anyway, let me just go back up and see if the, I see another question up at the top. All right, so that's about it. Anyway, so thanks everybody for watching. I think that's it for me today. Um, hopefully I'll be able to live stream something again tomorrow. Uh, have a great Christmas, everybody, for those of you that celebrate Christmas. Otherwise, a great uh, holiday with your families. Anyway, talk to you soon.